Um, so I don't know if I put it on the announcements. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about two things. One, uh, kind of teamwork and teams. Um, and then the second half, we have a guest who's gonna come in and talk about ethics. Um, and hopefully he's able to find the room and all that jazz. Um, and then there's gonna be an assignment associated with the ethics component, which we'll review next Thursday. So coming up, we have, so ethics today, then on Tuesday, we have the uh, project pitches. Um, and then on Thursday, we'll, uh, I think we're gonna do EDA. Um, so uh, basically how do you, like one of the approaches to analyzing data for uh, machine learning scenarios kind of. Um, and then uh, we'll do this, the second half again, will be about ethics, the kind of follow up part. Um, you know, one thing I'll note is these guys, um, you know, I teach two similar classes, right? So this one, as well as one about software engineering. For all of you, machine learning, data science, uh, ethics are a big deal, right? It is very, very easy to fall into ethical traps. Um, and so take, take this part very seriously. I tend to talk about ethics a lot uh, as, as I give lectures or whatever. Um, but what Seth is coming in to talk about is like kind of the formal framework, um, which can kind of guide you to, to know how to ask the right questions while you gain experience, you know? So it helps a lot if you're like, oh, okay, I know if I go through this checklist, it'll help. And then eventually, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you'll be like, oh, it's the whole checklist is already in my head. And I kind of sneak it in the conversations, you know? Um, but so that's why we like to teach you the framework so that you have kind of something that will be there in lieu of your actual experience. Um, and the same is true actually with this team. So, uh, and as soon as I get a chance, I will post the note on Piazza about where the assignments are, um, but they are on Gradescope. They should be unlocked right now, um, but I'll put a link on Piazza too. Any questions? All right, any problems with the assessment? Has anybody been working on it at all? Been any progress? Yes. All right, anybody looked at it yet? All right, all right, that's good. Um, it is important. It will probably take a bit of time. So make sure you figure out, uh, you know, take a look at it before, you know, the last minute. <clears throat> okay, moving on to teamwork and team. Um, so I mentioned this as kind of something completely different, right? Because one of the things that we're covering in this class is kind of the practice of doing machine learning. So it's important to think about how teams work, um, uh, both from a kind of in the abstract sense, because you know you you will not go in and not be on a team. Like it's just that's how it works, right? Um, but the other part of it is there's um, you know kind of a hub component. So we're going to talk a little bit about it in terms of that hub component, um, just to, you know to kind of make sure we cover that. But so from a formal perspective, okay, so there's been a lot of research done on this, particularly since COVID started. In some ways, uh, it's been very beneficial to the kind of social, uh, like sociology world of COVID, because now you have this interesting new dynamic where everybody's remote, right? So what is that, what is that doing to things like teams and teamwork? How does it change how they work together? So there's been actually a lot of interesting research there. Um, and, you know, as much as, you know, do not, you know, do not repeat this outside of this room, you know, but go check out HBR, Harvard Business Review. There's a lot of good stuff there. Uh, I like it in general, um, especially when you talk, if you are interested in like how companies work. Um, and so there's a bunch of stuff there. I'm cribbing from some of their articles uh, quite a bit in this talk. Uh, so, you know, uh, props to, you know, the people who were involved. Um, but so when you talk about a team, <clears throat> there are kind of three things that make up a good team. Okay. And one of them is, and, and it's a little like the, the word choices are a little tough, but teammates should have autonomy. All right. They should have confidence and they should have relatedness. All right. So I'm going to go through these words individually. Uh, can somebody here tell me what autonomy means? As people in tech, you should know this. Yeah. Right. 
freedom is a good word for it. That's kind of like a loosey goosey wrapper. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit different than straight freedom, but it's a, it's a good word. You know, the reason I mentioned it as being in the software world, um, you know, autonomous systems, autonomous robots, you know, all of those, you know, where is where it crosses into like AI, right? So, um, so the point here is that uh, autonomy means that uh, the team members should have autonomy. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail. Um, and then, okay, competence. What does competence mean? Yeah. Lovely. Right, so, uh, but not just knowing what you're doing, but actually being able to do it, right? Um, so, you know, your teammates should be competent, okay? And uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, I have, this is one of the reasons I don't normally do agenda slides because I tend to go into the entire slide on this one rather than waiting for it. Uh, what do you think relatedness means? It is kind of exactly what it sounds like, um, but you know, it sounds weird. So any ideas? Uh, not quite, more like, uh, you know, think about it in terms of a team and how it's connected, right? How is the team related? Okay. And it doesn't mean like, you know, married, it means like, how are they connected? Okay. And in some ways, that's almost the most important one. Okay. Even though it's kind of got a weird name. Um, okay. So we're going to talk about that stuff to kind of talk about teams in general. Okay. But then when you talk about teams that are good at being teams, they tend to share some characteristics about what they do to make that true, okay? And two of them are team agreements, okay? So basically you have some sort of document and it will often be formal, but it sometimes isn't, but it'll have some sort of document that says, this is how we work, okay? This is how we work together. This is how we work independently. So that, and you know, I say this in all my classes on the regular, right? Um, English is not actually that great. Neither is any other spoken language for communication in some ways, right? So if you write it down, it makes it easier for people to ensure they actually, you know, they're hearing what you're saying, okay? Um, job descriptions. This one's a weird one too, um, but basically is uh, you will see in good organizations that you're asked to rewrite your own job description on a pretty regular basis, okay? That might be yearly, maybe six months. I mean, you don't do it too often, you know, periodically. And what that does is it lets you capture on paper what you think you are actually doing and what you're actually responsible for versus what some generic job description says. Again, this can be like a formal document that's in like some system that HR approves and stuff like that, or it can be informal. But either way, this is something that's kind of important to keep track of you know, you're in a job for a while and keep track of how that job changes because it's there. Walk into a job and then it just be that for the rest of your life. Okay. Like, you know, we have a lot of turnover into other companies these days, but even with that, or, you know, even within one, one lifespan at one company, it is very unusual for your job to actually stay static. All right. So autonomy. Um, so there's a couple of points here I like to make, which is um, what autonomy means here is letting the team members define their work and then execute it themselves, okay? So uh, if you remember, I talked a little bit about Scrum and we talked about like the cards that you, you know, that I was describing that describe a piece of work or whatever. Um, so what's important about that is that you want your team to write those cards. Okay, if they're coming from somewhere else, they're not gonna be what the team understands to be what you're doing, okay? And then in particular, it's even have the individual who's gonna execute the work, write the work, okay? Does that make sense? All right, and then the other part of it is, I also mentioned the execute it, okay? So this is a, a sliding scale, a little bit based on the experience of the, of the person doing the task. But your boss should not be in there telling you what to do or how to do it, okay? And neither should anybody else, for that matter. There's often a, a somebody who thinks they know better than everyone else. The autonomy means that you have the ability to go and 
execute it correctly or incorrectly, right? And then, you know, and then fix your own errors or, you know, or you've got something good or whatever, but you, you need the experience of making mistakes and fixing them in order to not make them in the future, right? So if somebody's just spoon feeding you all your work, you're not gonna grow. Now, obviously, when you're really junior in an organization, the, the chunks of work are much smaller, right? And then as you get more experience, right, the chunks of work get bigger. Uh, but any which way, you should have a chunk of work that you have autonomy for, okay? Uh, and then one of the things I like to say, um, because somebody actually complimented me with this many years ago, um, your manager should be uh, what my friend, you know, referred to as a clear umbrella, okay? So an umbrella, you know, protects you from all the shit raining down, right? But is clear so that you as an employee can be seen by all the upper management and everything else. So uh, this autonomy thing kind of works on both sides, right? The, the individual needs to be, uh, you know, capable is not quite the right word, but like willing to be autonomous, but then their management also needs to be willing to let them be autonomous. Okay, so both those equations are important. Uh, so that's why I kind of bring it up. Um, if you ever end up in management, um, it can be quite fulfilling. It's uh, sometimes really interesting when you discover that just because you're good at something, that there are a lot of other people who are better at it and that you are better at making them better than you are than, at doing it yourself, which is a very hard thing to let your ego get over, right? Does that make sense? I know it's a really hard sentence to parse, but okay. All right, so then, look at the time, sorry. Uh, competency, okay. So competency is interesting because most people have the best intent for other people, okay? Which seems like a good thing, and it usually is. However, okay, there's two parts of that, okay? Um, so you should expect the best out of others. You should expect that they will do well and that they will do a good job, okay? And in that, you know, in that expectation, usually people will kind of rise to the challenge, okay? And this is even across a team. This isn't just like managers looking down you expect your teammates to build and deliver the best thing they possibly can, okay? And you act as if that's your expectation, okay? So you don't micromanage them. You don't second guess them. You expect that whatever that they're doing is the right answer. Does that make sense? And it, that again, can be hard to get used to, um, but you, it is something that helps a lot in the team dynamic and making a team that was, you know, the slang buzzwordy term is high performance teams. Um, but it really, it really does have some translation to the real world in that you have a stronger team if everybody on the team respects everyone else and expects the best from them, all right? However, you should remove bad apples, okay? And uh, so there's this talk that I, I uh, you know, I used to know kind of pretty regularly on the conference circuit, um, that is, you know, uh, words I won't repeat here are ruining your project um, or ruining your team. So this guy uh, was very involved, not Arch, but the other one, uh, one of the Linux distributions, um, starts with a G, totally blanking on the name of, um, and he was one of the leaders in that uh, organization, right, or in that community, okay? which usually have some hierarchical structure. What they noticed in that team or in that community was that they had kind of a bad actor, right? And that that bad actor was one of those people who's just kind of like always down and always negative and wasn't actively going and like hurting things per se, but was a very negative influence on everybody else in the community and was very prominent. So uh, this guy who has a, a somewhat of a data science background went and quote unquote did the math, right? And looked at what he believed the impact was uh, from this bad actor on the community. 
And then they asked the, this person to leave their community. They, you know, excommunicated him, right? Um, and so he looked at the result and found that it improved their community just to get rid of this one bad actor, even though that one bad actor did a ton of work. Okay, they did a lot of stuff for the community, like from a software perspective, but their negative influence was bad enough that it was driving away other community members. So while they might be able to do, you know, 10 units of work as a human, and most people can only do six, let's say, if you're driving away 10 people who can do six, that's still a net loss, right? So, uh, so I highly recommend this is a video. Um, I have never found a great recording of it, but this one's okay. Um, so you can pull it out of the slides later. Um, you know, I caution you, there's some, there's some swearing um, that I, I assume most of you are actually comfortable with, but you know, I do like to warn people just in case. Any, all right. Um, and, uh, and so oh, the last part I would just make is that, you know, particularly you see this in startups, but removing bad apples can have an outsized positive effect on the organization. Sometimes it is necessary to fire people. All right. And it's, it's a terrible thing to have to do. I have done it more than once, um, but it sometimes needs to be done. All right. All right. So this one is, as I say here, often the hardest thing to articulate, to execute, to you know, make happen, um, and has many different names. So if you ever, has anybody ever, have they all had like an internship of some kind or another? Um, okay, so has anybody there in those internships said, we want to, uh, we want to um, like reinforce or improve or whatever our culture? Does that ring any bells? All right, that's the same kind of thing here. It's like when, when somebody talks about the culture of an organization or the culture of a team or whatever, they're, they're also articulating the same relatedness idea. Okay, but so what does that mean? Well, it means that you want to build relationships between the humans on the team. Okay, so one of the examples I have for this, which I, I always was kind of jealous of, I thought it was great, um, was many years ago, a friend of mine uh, worked for a team, uh, I think it was at Oracle actually, and the entire team was remote, right? So none of them were in any proximity to each other or they may not have been, been a proximity, proximity to any individual offices. But what the company did for them was on a quarterly basis, which is pretty often, they actually brought the whole team together. Um, and made sure that they had an opportunity to basically all sit in the same room together so that you could build this relatedness thing. Uh, actually, for many years, did this accidentally, okay? By sending, they had a couple of big tech conferences, both that they ran and heavily participated in, you know, kind of depending on which conference it was. And whole teams would go to the conference and then sometimes also have a set of meetings around the conference so that they could, uh, and, and basically that was how they solved that relatedness problem. Um, one of the things, and this is a little bit inside baseball, but I think Red Hat management leadership didn't realize was that they were driving this, like I said, kind of by accident. And so they uh, started cutting down on how often you could send a team to a conference, which had a pretty negative effect on this Red Hat is uh, very um, like dis, uh, I can't think of words today, disparate kind of organization, like lots of the different teams work quite differently. So the teams where that was kind of rolled out faster, you saw a very negative effect in those teams. It was really interesting. So that relatedness thing really matters. It really does lead to a high performing team. And it can be very difficult to implement or institute. And then on top of that, to maintain it, right? And so when a company talks about maintaining their culture or reinvent, you know, re or stuff, really this is what they're getting at, is how can we get this relatedness between our employees? They're often talking about it at the company level, but if you can do it with each individual team, you know, you kind of by extension then get the whole company. So a couple of tricks, 
uh, that you see in a, a well-connected team. So like if the team is doing these things, that means there's good relatedness and it also causes good relatedness. That makes sense. So the first one, particularly I bet for all of you, pick up the phone, right? Uh, the temptation is, you know, how many people did you talk to using some mechanism other than it happens to, you know, wander by them that wasn't just text in the last 24 hours, right? Was it zero? Raise your hand if it was zero. All right, more than that. All right, so if there's, how about, let's say less than five. All right, so challenges that we've had with the advent of chat and email and all that stuff is that it's a very low bandwidth communication mechanism. Okay, and low bandwidth in this sense means there's very little data transfer besides the letters. Okay, and this is why you get misunderstandings and stuff like that all the time in chat techniques, right? So when you are communicating with someone, and you, you can usually tell when it's kind of going off the rails a little bit, like they're not following you or you have to keep writing a ton and, and they're not getting it and that stuff. Pick up the phone, right? And pick up the phone can mean a video chat. It could be a literal phone call. It could be walk down to their office, whatever. But move into a high bandwidth communication mechanism um, and usually you'll resolve whatever problems and it will improve the relatedness partially because of these other things okay so that that one at least for me is i know particularly difficult like i am very text-based in general like i don't do well with like video i don't do well with images particularly well you know i like to read um and so when i'm communicating with others it can be a challenge because sometimes i need to pick up the phone and i really don't want to because i like typing right so keep that in mind it really does help uh, and it should be something that you have in the back of your mind, you know, kind of picking you. Like I, I took a cooking class in the Czech Republic, so I still have this Czech chef who screams at me in the back of my mind every time I scrape a board with a knife, right? So going forward, every time you start to get into one of those annoying conversations over chat, hopefully my I'm screaming at you, pick up the phone, right? Okay, so chit chat is not a bad thing. So. And it can be very difficult when the team is remote, right? Because the only time they're generally interacting is via some meeting, right? In some sort of high bandwidth style. So find ways to incorporate non-work connections between team members. And there's been a ton of attempts at this over the course of COVID, right? Um, you know, I know my team at Red Hat, right? We instituted happy hours, okay? And so we, what we did was, it was kind of funny because it, it evolved into something that worked quite well. Um, but started out as kind of a stupid idea. Um, but what we ended up doing was about, I want to say it was once a week, I can't remember exactly, but about once a week, we would have like a team meeting that was scheduled to be, let's say an hour, but the content of the team meeting, and then the rest of the time was meant to just hang out, chit chat, you know, have a beer, you know, or, or talk about, you know, we had a, like a number of people on the team who were like, really serious whiskey aficionados and they would talk about that you know we had another guy on the team who built and raced cars and so he would pretty regularly be like oh yeah i just want to race this weekend you know stuff like that so if you can build in those kinds of constructs it really does help your team uh connectedness uh because you think about the people as people right rather than just you know a work colleague um so now that is often paired with a problem of poor meetings, okay? So what happens a lot of the time, if there is no venue for this chit chat thing, it often happens in meetings. And so the problem with that is that now, because that's not what you're supposed to be doing in that time period, to annoy a number of people in the meeting, or it's not going to be as effective, or you're not going to get the meeting accomplished, or whatever, et cetera. So be sure that your meetings are good, right? Make sure that they have a purpose, that they go to that purpose, and they have an outcome. Now, it could be, a, you know, it could be that an agenda helps, uh, that often does with time, okay? And you might have a timekeeper on that agenda, 
Um, but a lot of meetings are, are single event things, right? It's like, okay, we have this problem. We need to come up with a design for it or something. So that can be the entire agenda. So it kind of depends on what the meeting is, but the idea is that having good meetings, uh, it can make a big difference. The other thing that uh, I'll mention and is mentioned in a lot of the text, you know, about this kind of thing is there in a, a good meeting will usually have pre-work, okay? So like read some document or, you know, prepare some whatever um, before the meeting. What I, the reason I have Amazon up here is because Amazon actually has this weird thing where, I mean, not weird like bad, but weird like very unusual. I don't know that anybody else does this that they actually build time into the meeting for the pre-work, okay? So if they need a half hour meeting, they actually make it an hour. And at the start of the meeting, everyone is distributed whatever the pre-work is, like, you know, read this blah, blah, blah. Um, and then they're given half an hour during the meeting slot to read it. So you all may not have experienced this too much, right? But what happens when you're kind of working in the corporate world is it tends to be that you you start getting very interrupt driven so like meeting interrupt driven and so the first time you think about a meeting that's on your calendar is when the alarm goes off that you need to go to it right so you often don't do that pre-work or a lot of people don't do that pre-work so it's a really interesting model where they they do this pre-work during the meeting and the reason they call them paper meetings is because they're usually literally on paper so they actually distribute the document printed in hard copy and give it out to everyone in the room. They can pull this off to some extent, right? Because uh, for at least for a long time, uh, Amazon was very centrally located aside from like their delivery service, right? But all the software people were largely in the same place. Um, and so physical paper can be done. Uh, I don't know very much about what they're doing today, right? With all the remote work and all that other stuff but I do know they're kind of legendary in the industry for these paper meetings things. All right, any questions so far? All right. Um, so the next one is honesty, okay? And so honesty is saying what you can do and not sugarcoating, right? Not, uh, you know, not making it more than you can actually do, but at the same time, not making it less than what you, have, you can do. This is often referred to as being authentic, right? So it makes a big difference to a team if you can be authentic whenever you're conversing. This is very, very difficult, uh, you know, and, and more so, I think, in our industry than some. Um, but like, uh, has anybody ever heard of imposter syndrome? So a, a rampant problem in the industry. Um, sorry, my uh, phone just keeps ringing today. Um, imposter syndrome is this idea that I'm in this thing, you know, this job, this whatever, and I, and, and somebody's going to realize sometime in the very near future that I'm actually not qualified to do it. Okay. Um, as a corollary, has anybody ever heard of the Peter principle? Um, this, I think it, I mean, it definitely predates imposter syndrome, but I think it actually tries to capture the same idea, which is if you think about it, you're going to be promoted to your highest level of incompetence, right? Because if you were competent at that job, if you were good at that job, you would get promoted again, right? So, you know, when you're, when you're in a job, that means that you're at the highest level that you can function at. Not always true, certainly, but it is something to think about. And I think it kind of goes hand in hand with that imposter syndrome thing is that, no, you, you are, like, if you could do everything in your job, then you should be promoted to something where you can't do everything in your job and you can grow into it or get better at it or whatever. But if you're being unchallenged, you're also not particularly useful, right? So I think those two things kind of go hand in hand. It could be really, really difficult. Um, and like, there's, there's lots and lots of talks about this on the internet. You know, if you feel like you're struggling with this, I am happy to talk to you about it ever, you know, if you want to, but also there's a ton of like, you know, I hesitate to say research as much as to say like guidance and like suggestions and things like that about how to kind of wrap your head around the fact that 
no, you probably are just fine at what you're doing um, because everyone else around you is, you know, of what you can do and they put you in the position that you can do it. So that's kind of what that honesty thing is. It goes both ways, right? Is that I can do this um, and I can't do that and that's fine, right? Does that make sense? All right. Uh, all right. Moving on to kind of the next subject. So, and I don't know if I'll have time for the exercise, so I may follow up with it later, but team agreements. Okay, so team agreements. Uh, okay, I probably should have put in an example, but team agreements usually have a construction like this. Okay. Um, they may be missing some of them, they may have a couple more, but they're usually similar to this. Um, the first thing is, what is this team's mission? Okay, what is like? Why are we coming in every day? Okay, what's the what is the the how are we going to change the world component? Um, and then, kind of definitely not the same is what are the values of that team? Okay, and a value might be something like honesty, but it could also be like uh, you know uh, Google's old uh, famous slogan that they don't have anymore. You know, do no evil. Right. Um, and, you know, or, you know, when you're talking about machine learning, you know, I talk about ethics a lot, you know, be ethical. Right. So those are the values that are important to this team. Um, and then responsibilities, this kind of gets into that job description component. So it can be responsibilities for the humans on the team, but generally it's also the responsibilities of the team itself. Okay. So what are you going to produce? Um, and then decisions, this is another one, actually, uh, universities are very, very into this uh, thing, is who participates in decisions and who makes decisions, okay? Um, those are not always the same thing, right? Uh, has anybody ever heard of RACI? Uh, RACI is, uh, let's see, responsible, ah, active? No, responsible, um, I should have looked it up beforehand. I can never remember what the letters stand for. Um, but the, uh, basically, it's, yeah, it's responsible, whatever the A is, um, and then consulted and informed. Um, and basically, the idea is that in any given thing, there's a set of stakeholders. Some of those stakeholders might be responsible for doing the work. They might be consulted on whether or not we should do this thing and how. And then is there some people who are informed about the work, which is like, you know, hey, we did this thing and you might be interested, right? We built a new API that now you can call. Um, did somebody quickly look up what the A stands for? All right, I can look it up. Um, like a lot of this stuff, uh, tech related in general, um, the Wikipedia articles on them are usually shockingly good. Um, accountable, that's it. Um, so uh, yeah, so you know, some people on the team right are accountable for a particular thing. So that decision matrix is important um, because what you don't want is a misunderstanding where you know boss man thinks that they're the sole decision maker on you know this thing, where the team thinks uh, that you know oh no this is a collective decision. So they can be they can be quite important. Um, and like I was saying, is like BU like most universities has a literal huge spreadsheet of this for all kinds of different decisions, like how you hire new faculty members, how do you hire a lecturer, how, you know, whether or not they're uh, gonna get approved for tenure, stuff like that. Um, and then how we work, okay? So how we work, this is kind of the biggest one here for me is communication and expectation on communication. So we're all gonna use Slack and we're gonna use email, okay? What is the response time expectation on Slack? It can be, but it better be written down in this list. So that's the important part. It can be whatever you want it to be, but if you aren't all on the same page, you're gonna have a bad day, right? Because somebody's gonna write a Slack message and expect a two minute response and the person receiving it expects to respond within eight hours, right? Same with email. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, most organizations, right? If it's a IM chat, the chat client, whatever like Slack, the expectation is that it will be no more than a few hours. 
um, whereas email tends to be longer at long form. So it can be a couple of days. But you want to know what the answer to that is before uh, somebody pings you and expects a response, right? Um, because uh, particularly as the world is kind of changing, there are a lot of people who use email like it's a chat because the chats didn't exist when they started working, right? So uh, that's so it can lead to very difficult problems. Uh, it actually happens to me on the regular with somebody at BU where I, I slack them or whatever and I expect a quick response where they are like two days later, they're like, oh, just saw your Slack message. But if I send them an email, I get something back in like 15 seconds. So, you know, find out how that team's gonna work and make sure everybody agrees. Um, metrics, that's another really important one is that how is this team gonna be measured, right? So what, so this can be both co coming from outside the team, but it's better if the, in, if the team itself can say, this is what we're gonna do. And this is how we're going to measure ourselves to do it. Um, you'll see this uh, often called um, ah, blanking on acronyms today. Um, yeah, I'm made famous by Google. Um, yeah, totally blanking on acronyms today. Um, yeah, all right, I'll cover that some other time. But um, and then meetings and stand ups. And then does anybody know what? Uh, so, okay, first up, let me know what a stand up is. What is a stand up? Exactly. You know why it's called a stand up? And you know why they, oh, so not just to give it. So, the reason it's a stand up is everybody in the meeting is meant to stand. That way, the meeting takes less time because you're not comfy, right? Everybody's supposed to be standing there. Then you go around the room and answer. It's usually these three questions, which is like, "What am I? What did I just work on? What am I working on today? And what do I need help with?" Uh, you know, so like blockers or whatever. Uh, often those kind of sentences are phrased slightly differently, but they're accomplished. They're looking for the same information. Um, okay, uh, and then the last which is the definition of done. They may know what this is. So this one is, I think, uh, subtly very important, okay? And all too often not covered in something like a team agreement, which is the, how do I declare that the piece of work that I'm done doing is finished, okay? And that seems like an obvious answer, but it's really not. So think about it from a programming perspective, because that's where most of my experience is. So most of my examples are programming. Does, if I wrote all the code, is it done? Not necessarily, right? Uh, it's maybe after I've written all the code and it passes tests, is that done? Again, not necessarily. It could be, I've written all the code, I've passed all the tests and it's deployed to production, okay? So there can be a, and you have to like agree, right? All three of those are done in word, but unless we come up with an advance, what we mean by that as a team, you're gonna have somebody say, oh, I'm done. And somebody else say, oh, I'm done and be two wildly different states, okay? So that's why I think that one's really important and gets short shrift a lot of the time. Um, and let's see, let's quickly cover job descriptions and then we'll do the exercise that I wanted to do some other time so that we can talk about ethics. Um, okay, so job descriptions. So how many here have read a job description? All right, how many people here have written a job description? All right, these are usually the key components, okay? So especially these first two. This is what you see, but I'm kind of putting it in terminology that is the where where I was describing the job description, where you're you're kind of using it as a way to review your job and what you're doing and why you're doing it. Okay, rather than a job description that you're going to publish on the web and look to hire somebody for. So, what are the things that I do? Okay, and why do I do those things? All right, and 
And this is the part in particular that changes over time. <clears throat> and then who else could do this? Or are there parts of my job that I'm doing that somebody else could be doing and free me up to do more of what I consider either important or interesting or whatever? Um, so that's a very important thing. This is not a job security problem. This is a, you usually, when you are in an organization for a while, gather more work than you could possibly do. But it doesn't make any of it any less important, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it all. Okay, so that's why it's an interesting thing to figure out. And then hopefully you show it to your boss and they're like, oh yeah, I'll give those 15 things you didn't want to do to Joe over there. He's not doing enough anyway, right? And then what will I become or what I will become? Um, this is kind of like, okay, and where, what is, where is my growth? Okay, so like, what is going to make it so that I'm better at what I'm doing or, or how do I move to the next level? Um, usually counts in terms of, you know, kind of like what I'm doing and what I want to be doing. All right, make sense? Any questions? All right, then I will uh, offer you the stage. Yeah, um, that was my idea. Um, I just, I'm not sure, do you know where it is? Or do you want to? Okay, let me get there. No, I got it. Um, I'm trying to have some organization. Uh, which one do you want? Yep, the very top one. Okay. And uh, so the monitor is that way as far as the computer is concerned. Um, and I'll just try to set it up for you, give you a little bit less of a headache. Um, and not do a very good job, apparently. And I am going to let you introduce yourself rather than destroy your last name. Um, there is a camera here. If you try to stay in it, that'd be awesome. If you don't, it's not the end of the world. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Perfect. All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'll be a guest here today with all of you. It's, it's great to be here. So today I'm actually going to talk to you about algorithmic fairness. Uh, specifically in, with something related to the compass assessment, which we'll get to in a little bit. But before we talk about that, I just want to tell you a little bit about who I am. So uh, I did my undergraduate at Stanford, and that's how I kind of got involved with this sort of technology scene and, and sort of get very interested in it. So Silicon Valley is a big part of who I am. Uh, currently out of the School of Theology in the Religion and Science program, I mainly study the interaction between, say, ethics and values and science, technology, those sorts of things, trying to make this as logical, as interrelated as possible. And one of the big things we're actually helping with, uh, me and my advisor, Wesley Wildman, is developing curriculum specifically for the new computing and data sciences unit, uh, specifically related to the PhD ethics requirements. And so a lot of this stuff that you're getting today is kind of being piloted in a sense. And so your feedback, either to me or to someone else within CDS would be really crucial in terms of how useful is this kind of thing to you? Is it practical? Is it meeting your needs? Because the university is kind of at a time where it's trying to figure out a lot of what this is supposed to look like. And in fact, the universities across uh, all of America are trying to figure out that sort of stuff too. So uh, I think it's an interesting time trying to definitely figure out some of this stuff. I do host some conversations on this sort of thing as well. Um, on a podcast called Digethics, if you're ever interested. But uh, if you have any questions through the course of this lecture, just go ahead and raise your hand. That's totally fine. We'll just get to it immediately. So a little bit of what we'll be talking about, uh, basically the way that we refer to things here is something called ethics and responsible computing. So we're going to talk a little bit about what exactly is that. We'll talk about the machine bias article from PubPublica, and then basically go through a little bit of the implications of that. So what is the specific technology involved? What is the kind of machine learning that goes on into it? Uh, what, how do we kind of consider the different sorts of fairness of this, especially the kind of statistical categories that are used in that area? Then kind of more general challenges to data, to doing ethics and data science in general. And finally, a little bit about predictive policing. Okay. So ethics and responsible competing, or ERC, that's kind of the way we're talking about that here. 
Basically, it refers to the tools, habits, and practices that help one to make responsible decisions with computing. So anytime we're using a computer or using technology, something that helps us make the kinds of decisions, like ERC. And if you want to know stuff, I would highly recommend that you go and look at the ACM, so the Association for Computing Machinery. They have a code of ethics. Uh, that's a lot of what this is based around. And the kind of thing that when you're going to be a professional, the sorts of standards that you'll be expected to follow. Um, also, I uh, highly recommend you look up the Sanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Application of Ethical Theories to Computers and Computer Networks. Uh, a lot of people are trying to figure out this sort of stuff, especially because of the interrelatedness and the kind of, uh, well, if you're using a computer to do something and does something you don't intend, it, the kind of ethical agency that you're exercising at that point can be a little cross, to say the least. All right. So the main topic of today is going to be about an article in ProPublica called Machine Bias. And the main thing that this is talking about is related to specifically following two people and the kind of differences in the way that their, their sentences were weighted at, um, at their kind of probation hearings. So a little bit about what this and what is the recidivism assessment. So recidivism is just the rate of reoffense. So consider someone gets arrested and then they have a hearing basically and, basically, and they have to decide, is this person going to be a risk? Should we put them in jail? Should they be released? All these sorts of things kind of come into play. So basically, what Northpoint, now Equivant, notably after this article was published, the company that created the assessment rebranded themselves with a new name, which I think is interesting. But they created this assessment, and it's 100 plus questions basically designed the relative risk of releasing someone based on and again, that's just how likely are they to commit another crime, be a threat to society, that sort of thing. So uh, ProPublica discovered that Black Americans were given nearly twice as high of a score, and only 20% of the people that were predicted to commit violent crimes went on to do so. And so if we think from a kind of a, a, kind of a practical perspective, it, it didn't really accomplish what it was meant to do. And I think this is a crucial part of why I designed this sort of thing, and was it actually successful? and what we are trying to do. So if we want to look at some of the actual questions, and again, this is an interesting thing, I think, for all of you as people doing this sort of stuff of how is it that you actually get the kind of data that you need to make this sort of assessment in the first place. And this is just kind of some examples of things. So how many prior offenses, weapon offenses, you know, drug trafficking, and the way those things are rated from zero, one, two, three plus, right? Where is the kind of statistical relevance of those sorts of things? What kind of questions need to be asked? Uh, there have been also some controversial questions on this. They related to, for instance, do you know someone who's been arrested, like proximity to people who committed crimes? And so even just pulling out individual things, you might start to question, say, the validity of some of that stuff and if it's relevant and actually doing a kind of assessment on someone to see if they'll commit another crime. So actual use case for Compass, and this is the, I think one of the biggest things that I want all of you to be thinking about, especially if you're kind of designing your own projects. Yep, go ahead. Yep. 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 This is actually a really great question, right? So it assigns a score and that's basically how it works. So you take a hundred plus questions, you kind of put them into an algorithm and it spits out a single number, right? And so the numbers can range from one to 10. Uh, we'll get to some, some of what those numbers are, but that's exactly the right question, right? Which is how do you take all these different data points and boil it down to just one single output, right? Yeah. Like a number like three. Right, like what does a three mean exactly? It, it was, they, they decided, they enough, they yeah, yeah. So, so basically, um, we'll talk about this in, in just a little bit, but uh, a judge would be given the score like on a profile of someone. So, say, like I was being assessed, I, it, would, it would give my criminal record, it would say everything that I have done, and in addition to that, the compass would also spit out a number. Right, so one would be the lowest and 10 would be the highest. And uh, there's actually a few different metrics, but uh, say like a five is like middle of the road, but, but a one is, I think the more important thing to consider is like a one, two or three is very low. 
and like an eight, nine, or ten is very high, yeah. right? So the people who have a either get one of those sorts of ratings is, you know, that that leads to someone to either maybe lean into something or not. And this again goes into there's there's a human factor too of a judge. Yeah. So if you're a judge and you think like, oh, this person's harmless, yeah. um, and I see a score of a one, it's probably going to reinforce something you already think. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, in terms of the actual uh, use case, I think uh, we spoke a little bit about here, but yeah, it's going to be spitting out a number related, and which is going to be given to a judge to help them to make a decision. And so, recidivism is actually one of the most important cases in criminal justice because whether someone will receive probation, not go on probation, be released, have the sentence extended, all these sorts of things are related to someone carrying out a judgment later, right, later on in the process. And so ideally what can happen is that you'll take a vast amount of data, more data than a judge maybe has time to go through with, and then boil it down in such a way that it's very digestible, very easy to read, makes a lot of sense, and, and hopefully accurate. So if it's working as intended, the tool will provide an unbiased data-backed assessment that's accurate to what happens with time. And this is actually the most important thing, which is if we say that someone is going to and then they do, right, that means the, that means that it works, right? But if we think that if they give them a score that says they'll reoffend and they don't, then there, there's a problem, right? Which was what, what we talked about earlier when the other slides mentioned. If we say that people in the high-risk category and only 20% of them actually go on to reoffend. That's a really big discrepancy related to what the assessment is actually trying to do. So uh, one of the other things I want to bring up in terms of bias and why someone might choose to create this sort of tool, uh, I want to bring up this example from uh, Danziger, Danziger in 2011, okay, which was related to this study that found that judges actually tend to be more lenient right after they've eaten something, right? So if a judge just had lunch, they'll probably be more lenient than right before lunch. And so there's all these things that go into, oh, how can we use data to make it so that these sentencing procedures are actually more fair than they would be otherwise? So these sorts of things are kind of in the back. Like, why would someone choose to create this? And that's actually, want to, as engineers, to be thinking about, it's not their intention to create a flawed instrument, right? But if the instrument is flawed, what do we do at that point? You know, how does that uh, affect society and everything else? This is also very funny. I definitely recommend you look into it. So in terms of the actual risk scales, which I think you asked about earlier, there's going to be three different ones. So there's a pretrial release assessment, which is basically, um, it measures the potential for an individual to fail to appear and to commit new felonies while on release, right? So if they go about in society, will they commit another felony? And or according to their research, the scale um, takes track of current charges, pending charges, prior, prior arrest history, previous pretrial failure, residential stability, employment status, community status, and substance abuse. And they, they think that these are these the most significant indicators affecting pretrial risk scores, right? So basically, before someone even comes in, they'll take these on, see what's going on. Then there's the general recidivism scale, which is the one that the article is mainly talking about. And this is just, just designed to see if someone will go on and predict if they're going to go on and have another offense at some later point in time. Uh, the scales use an individual's criminal history and their associates, drug involvement, and indications of juvenile delinquency. Basically, just do they have a history of this sort of thing? And will that history continue? And finally, there's the violent recidivism scale, which is kind of related to the previous category, but specific for violent criminals in particular, which I think are among some of the crimes we'd be most wanting to not have happened again, right? We wouldn't want violent crimes to be occurring. So that's one of the most, uh, I think, serious uses and the use cases of this kind of technology. So this information comes from a professor at Yale, Joan Feigenbaum, and she basically, off and there's kind of two conflicting ideas about the fairness of this kind of technology, okay? So first, North Point, the people who created it are gonna say, yes, okay, this technology is fair. Well, what do they mean by that? They mean that for each value of C, right, and C is going to be the actual score that's given to someone, the percentage of white defendants with that score of, of say, one, two, three, doesn't matter, 
and the percentage of who are black will be the same. And basically it's just called equalized odds. So if someone gets a five, it doesn't matter what race they are, right? They are as nearly likely to reoffend as someone of another race, okay? But ProPublica basically says, no, this is actually unfair. And the reason why they say this is unfair is because it's not about, say, the individual scores having statistical parity between them, but rather that people of different races are assigned different scores much more likely uh, uh, at vast differences. So if we actually take a look at this, I know how well you're able to see this, but if it is the case that white is nearly twice as likely to be given a, a low score as someone who's black, right? Then the, the equalized odds that going into someone being a five aren't nearly the same because a because basically, if you're up here in these statistical distributions, as you can see, they're much more even, right? Black defendants are much more likely to be in the, the high category between five and 10 than someone who's white. And actually in this, we can see that they're overwhelmingly at the one range, right? So even if the, the scores seem to be kind of somewhat valued, the, the distribution of those scores is actually, there's something going on there, right? Like there's something very fishy, in the data, it doesn't quite look right. The, dis the distributions look really weird. And again, the, the sort of a uh, prompting case for this, the reason why ProPublica decided to look into this has everything to do with the fact that you have examples of people with this one score, right, who are going on to commit crimes, right, even violent crimes, people in the kind of upper bound range who don't go on to commit those crimes, even though they're given a high score. And so there's some sort of problem with the way this tool actually works, the kind of assessments that it's making. There's, there's, there's some bigger issues going on, right? Like whatever it was designed to do, it's not quite accomplishing those sorts of things. So the way that Feigenbaum talks about this is called something called balance versus calibration. And so the reason why it's difficult with something like machine learning to establish kind of a consistent score, right? Where either, you know, you'll kind of be giving people roughly equal distributions across the board, or it'll be the case that the, a score for one person will not mean the same as a score for another. And uh, let, let me put it this way, let's, uh, let's go back and look at this. So, so there's two ways that this could happen, okay? Either it's gonna be the case that we have roughly equal distributions for both, or it's the case that a five for a white defendant and a five for a black defendant just don't mean the same thing, right? Where a five for a black defendant still means like a higher risk of some sort. And that's just because of um, when we're talking about the lack of calibration, it's because the actual recidivism rates, right? Or the predicted recidivism rates kind of from, kind of from a broader statistical perspective are unequal. So they can't mean quite the same thing and the way that this kind of works out is you're gonna have the kind of heavily tilted towards having black defendants in that higher range, almost no matter what, because of the underlying data structure that's already there. So I know it's a little bit complicated, but uh, we'll keep trying to explain it as best we can. But basically anytime you have two populations with different rates that you're trying to assess with the same score, you're gonna run into this kind of a problem. So what this basically means is that as long as we are trying to boil things down to a single number, we're not gonna be able to both kind of balance and calibrate the way that the model works in a way that kind of satisfies all the parties involved. And so the final point is uh, from Kearns and Roth, it is impossible for the predictive algorithm to have near equal numbers of false positives and false negatives. It can achieve one or the other in a statistical parity. This is another way in which, say again, it really matters what, like if someone's more at risk for one or the other. And so to go back to our actual statistics, if we're more likely to have a, um, a false negative for a, for a white defendant, but a false positive for a black defendant, that means you're gonna be much harsher on one group of people than on the other, right? That's kind of the overall effect that it's gonna end up having. So these problems are always gonna happen anytime 
there's going to be two or more groups with observed differences in rates. And this is a very practical thing all of you have to consider because there's going to be different types of people, different types of behavior. If you're trying to profile people in sort of anything, th this is always going to be coming up. And so any single metric is going to have difficulty capturing that just because of the underlying sort of data problem involved. So second, we might have to consider that the information upon which predictions are being made may itself be biased in some way. So there's actually lots of reasons to be thinking that the kind of historical data, especially related to crime data, may be flawed in some way, may be biased in some way. And also if there's cases of historical discrimination, how exactly do you take that into account? Is it possible to take that into account? It becomes very complicated very quickly. And so in this case, historical discrimination makes it highly likely that the information fed into the compass algorithm was biased by prejudice, at least to some extent. Then finally, predictions of this type of viable and near perfect information. And uh, this is something I really want to hit home for all of you, which is that you can't have perfect information, right? Your, your, your information is always going to be unreliable to some extent. It's not going to be measuring stuff that you want to be measuring. And if you think about it, the compass assessment isn't necessarily testing what ethnicity people are, right? But it's using other kinds of proxies within that data such that between the two groups of people, if you have an independent third party like ProPublica go in and do an audit of that, they end up finding out that there's a huge discrepancy in the way in which it's treating people of different groups. So, uh, and because of the, and one of the other things to keep in mind is because of this kind of perfect information problem, especially when it's related to things like policing or security and other sorts of stuff, the, the groups that you might most want to get that information from might be very distrustful of you and unwilling to give it to you. And this is actually something that happens a lot with, uh, I guess, facial recognition, in which because so much of that technology these days is going into kind of policing, surveillance sorts of efforts and being spearheaded by law enforcement agencies, uh, there, there are certain communities who are just very suspicious of that. They don't want in their communities. They're not looking to make that technology better so it can track people better. It's not their goal. So predictive policing is kind of the, the last thing that I want all of you to be thinking about, which is if you're creating an assessment to predict whether people will kind of commit crimes in the future, you're basically trying to hold people accountable for something they maybe haven't done yet, right? And actually, the American Mathematics Society in 2020, basically they signed a big petition saying, hey, like we don't want anything, to, we don't want to be a part of this. Like this sort of thing shouldn't be happening. Uh, they didn't say it's too much like minority report, but that's kind of the direction that it's going in, right? Of, hey, like you haven't done this yet, but we consider you to be a person for one reason or another. And the other thing to consider is just that the people who are most affected affected by predictive police and are probably already in vulnerable communities of some sort. And this is actually one of the biggest areas of, again, in law enforcement, of how do you use predictions? Does that lead to over-policing in some areas? Does that lead to worsening relationships between law enforcement and between the people who actually live there? Uh, these things can get very complicated very quickly. Flawed tools can also reinforce rather than reduce bias. And what I mean by this is a uh, if you have a given conclusion in your head, if you're making a judgment on somebody and you think, oh, like this person's not a risk and then you see a low risk, you're going to be reinforced in the kind of bias that you have already. In addition, if you think, oh, this person is a risk when they might not be, but you see a high score, it's gonna also reinforce that. This is something called overconfidence that can come with technology. And it's a kind of paradox that we have to be dealing with all the time, which is, if we have some sort of a technology to tell us a given conclusion, we actually become a lot lazier in the way that we reason about things. And this can be go doubly if you're a judge. Imagine if you have to go through, you know, four or five cases in an hour that are very important to every single person who comes across. If you've ever actually been to some of these, ever been to court, uh, I've actually been to immigration court many times. Uh, these courses, these cases, these cases go really fast, right? Judges have to get through a lot of them. And so anything that allows them to make kind of cognitive shortcuts, they're gonna use. But again, it's nice to, to think of a tool that might allow you to make those decisions better, 
But if the tool doesn't actually work, and that has implications for people's lives, whether they're staying in jail, whether they're being released, whether they'll get to see their families again, it can be it can be pretty bad, right? Like a, a, a flawed tool actually made this worse, essentially. Thank you. And uh, oh yeah, finally. And I think the last question is, and this is a more philosophical thing, I think, for all of you, which is just related to if it's actually a good idea to be trying to hold people accountable to use technologies to kind of project the future and then to kind of, um, I don't know, entrench the future to some extent, right? Because if we have a kind of overconfidence in our ability to predict the future, then we're going to be really, you know, again, holding people accountable for things that they haven't done yet. We're going to be, you know, it, it doesn't have a good set of consequences in my mind. But it is something for all of you to think about, though, in terms of the kind of like broader order and political order that you have, especially like what kinds of projects should you be making? What kinds of companies do you work for? All of this sort of stuff comes up. And the actual law enforcement space for certain kinds of technology is probably much bigger than you can imagine. So uh, I'd be really be urging you to think through some of that stuff in terms of what are you actually able to do? You did try to make something like this again to eliminate, not to you know, cause bias, how could you make it so that that tool is used well rather than used poorly as it was in this specific case? And, and that's all. So does anyone have any questions about anything? Crystal clear? <laughs> Probably true. That might be a little bit of an old movie now. Uh, it should. It's definitely on the list of uh, uh, well, well referenced movies with Oh, yeah. But uh, again, I know I mentioned this earlier in the presentation, but as people who are trying to design products, I think people often want to design things that'll work better, that alleviate a kind of problem that they see in a space. And I think uh, there has to be some benefit of the doubt for say the creators of some of these tools. But um, one of the things which is really important is knowing like, is my tool working? Is it doing what it's intended to do? Is it making a problem worse? Uh, does it, you know, just does it work as intended? And, and these sorts of things are really important when you're designing products that work on their own, that people be interacting with, right? Especially if they're unsupervised. Um, but the kind of, underlying sort of data problems that are going on or, or stuff for you to think about and how you address those problems depending on what sort of thing you're working at can really affect the people who use it so just keep that in mind for the future and yep go ahead what so i don't think compass is necessarily used as much but there it compass is one of many there, there's not there's not just one of, of this type of assessment it's so compass was one of the first ones that was explored independently by a third party okay. so ProPublica actually went through a whole methodology where they went through several cases and basically followed up years later of like did these people reoffend or did they not offend and is this assessment actually working and what they found out is that it, it wasn't and so i think uh propublica's effort is actually a great example of using data to figure out if something is working or not, right? Uh, where they, you know, they had to create a lot of their own data sets and then out of that, they can assess, okay, this really isn't working, right? Um, I definitely highly look up, um, I think they had like a how we did it like methodology article, if you're interested in that sort of thing. But again, it involves a lot of going to court, keeping track of individual cases on a kind of longitudinal study, which can be very, um, it takes a lot of effort to do something like that, but there definitely are still assessments like this being used and they're being explored, I think, quite heavily. Sure. Uh, I don't know if you have to display it as much as just kind of say. So I'll post it to be out there. It's already on the radio. It should be pretty self explanatory, but basically, there's two assignments. One is uh, take a look at these case studies and kind of evaluate them in terms of like kind of this ethical framework, right? Um, and then the other one is, I don't know, do you want to explain the current event part? Sure. Uh, so there's, there's going to be
going to be kind of a hypothetical part, like a hypothetical assignment using case studies, right? These case studies are more fictionalized. Uh, they're a little bit more straightforward. I think they, they have a little bit of analysis embedded in them, and you can kind of select one from a list of them. But in addition to that, we all, we'd also like you to look up a current event, uh, something that's in the news, and just answer some questions about it. Uh, there's only a few questions. It's more to kind of get you to start thinking about these sorts of things. But uh, kind of looking at the implications, looking at the use case of this technology and why is it in the news, right? Because again, I, I think it's important to think as an engineer yourself, right? You're not necessarily trying to create something that ruins society, at least, at least hopefully not, right? Uh, most people aren't trying to design dystopian technology. If you are, we can talk about that later, <laughs> but... Uh, there's some people we can have you talk to. Um, the, and, and, you know, sadly, there should be plenty of examples mm -hmm. of these ethical issues. Um, you know, so we, just, we wanted to tie it back to hopefully we find the real world. Um, you know, uh, it would be awesome if it was related to some outside interest you have. You know, like I was mentioning a guy who built and raised his cars. You know, if you have something like that, you know, look, look in that space. It doesn't have to be a tech. It doesn't have to be, you know, general knowledge. Uh, look for something that's kind of cool, and then hopefully we'll be able to share some of it back to the class, uh, whatever it is. Yeah, know. yeah. Um, for the assignment, will be to upload what the actual current event is. So hopefully we can kind of build a database so that all of you can see it, kind of look at the sorts of things that are out there and the kinds of interests that all of you have, which would be great. Cool. All right. Uh, let's call it a day. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you on whatever the next class is. Tuesday? Tuesday. Okay. Thursday, right? Thanks so much for coming. Yep. All right. Now I'm going to shut everything down. Um, cool. And then, uh, so I'll see you again at uh, whatever, 5.30-ish, 5.30-plus, something like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh